<clears throat> All right. Once we're doing again, it live, folks, by the way. This doing is it thanks- live. Thanksgiving, we're doing it live. I think I'm just going to post a raw edit here because fantastic. We're recording so late today. <laughs> Three, two, one. Are, are we? Are we up yet? Yeah. All we're right. Because rec- we're recording. Because I can't see the Zencaster when my notes are open, so I yeah. never know. No, we are. Three, two, yeah. one. You can listen to the Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio or at our website proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this fine podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for November 27th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Recorded live just two miles south of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library gift shop, from which Donald Trump ordered the Lincoln desk and they sent him the Tad Lincoln desk. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. You gotta specify, Donald. You gotta specify, man. You gotta specify. You know that? It, 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 I just know. I just know. This was like, this is um, Spinal Tap stuff. You know, he sketched out on a little piece on a napkin what he wanted in, in inches instead of feet. And they, they gave him a little bitty desk. He said, and then some, God bless them, some um, assistant who didn't want to get his head ripped off that day right. said, oh no, you'll look like Godzilla. Go ahead and sit behind it. You look huge and intimidating. So this whiny baby man sat behind a little tiny desk and bitched and cried and snarled at people and And reminded people that for the first time in four years, reminded people that he's the president of the United States and that he uh, he ought to have some goddamn respect. Don't you insult me. (laughs) I'm still president. I'm president. And there's no other president but me. The only thing he's done more than golf is sit in the residence watching Fox. Oh, I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say the only thing he's done more than golf is lose in Georgia over well, that and too. over and over. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's um. As of today, I think he's thirty-eight and one in court. Yeah, and that'll be which 30- is a huge thing. I mean, I, I've said this. It really feels like you know, for conservatives, the day the music died. Yes. It's like. Yeah. We can't create our own reality in the courtroom. No. Well, there there are certain venues, there are certain mm-hmm. places, uh, unless you do what the Nazis did and fill the courts up with Nazi judges. Which they're trying to do. They're trying to. They, they, yeah. they, imagine four more years of this and they would have gotten away with it. Honestly, mm-hmm. they would have gotten mm-hmm. away with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the places you can't fool reality are currently the courtroom in some cases, although Neil Gorsuch is trying real hard to disprove that notion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and science. And mm-hmm. I don't mean like speculating about things that might happen in the distant future or in the or No, the just cause whether a virus will infect you or yes. not. Virus, this is how viruses work. And there's one running wild th- through the land. And here's shit you do to stop it. And here's what happens if you don't. And there are and, – and these are the two things that Donald Trump and his clown car ran into at 120 miles an hour mm-hmm. this week, really. I mean, this has been coming for a long time. But they really re- slammed into a bunch of people, a bunch of boring, ordinary civil servants who were doing arithmetic, and a bunch of scientists who said, "Look, if you if you get up close to each other and spit in each other's faces and yell and and swap swap perspiration, you're going to get sick. It's really, mm-hmm. really simple." And he and seventy three million other fascists in this country. Um, are going to lose. I have lost, I should say. Mm-hmm. I've already lost. But um, they are, as I said last week, probably Chekhov's Republicans. Um, they're, they're, they're the gun hanging on the wall. And that gun must be disassembled and thrown into the lake before it can hurt someone so or mm-hmm. hurt more people. And that's our job. That's the job right. of the liberal, right. crazy liberal left, providing a context for getting rid of Republicanism, not Trumpism, not Trumpists, not Trumpers, Republicanism in this country, piece by piece, and an acknowledgement of how hard that's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this is about picking your battles, right? This this episode is is this our third chapter, our third uh, item on our uh, <laughs> the, the syllabus, right, of right. political university. Pick your battles. Pu, as it's called. Pu, yeah. right. Pick pick your battles, mm-hmm. and I had a. 
hilarious. I put this on Twitter. I had a hilarious conversation with a junior dude today who is home from college. Mm -hmm. His entire campus had access to free COVID testing before he left. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was well organized. He was able to go in by himself to a testing area and get tested. Uh, It was not drive through. It was on campus. It was free. There was they were scheduled. I, I Augustana College has done a great job of managing COVID and mm-hmm. keeping people in their dorms, making sure that social distancing, following the science, following the guidelines. And uh, he, uh, Junior Dude, is home. Uh, he, he will have the rest of the semester at home. Yep. He will have all of his exams at home. And uh, he goes back for January term. Uh, depending. And I think, you know, they'll make a determination. But so far, so good as far as that campus is concerned with controlling uh, the access uh, of the campus to the virus. They've made sure that people are not congregating. Um, So good for them. Uh, So Junior Dude said, uh, what are you going to podcast about today? (laughs) And I said, none of your business. No, I I was happy to talk to him about it. I said, we're going to talk about picking your battles, recognizing your values and so forth. And he said, well, there's really only one battle right now. And that's the Senate races in Georgia, right? And I said, well, some people feel they need to battle over the makeup of Joe Biden's cabinet. And he said, he has to pick a pro pot attorney general. That's (laughs) non-negotiable. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll get right down to the Western Union office and get that telegram right off. All of a sudden, he had a battle and a passion and right. an advocacy and a and a and a, you know, mm-hmm. and and until I reminded him of it, he was focused on elections, right? But when I reminded him of this other thing that's going on, oh no, I'm passionate about that too. I've got this real you know, skin in the game in terms of marijuana legalization is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it is legal in in Illinois. So, you know, that's that's just the way that is. And uh, yeah, he has to pick a pro pot attorney general. (laughs) And if you would like to know uh, which states it is legal versus decriminalized, which states were first, what their experiences were and which state has decriminalized everything, just ask Junior Dude. Just ask Junior is, Dude. He is a compendium. <laughs> and and what various politicians' positions are on that one subject. Um, Last very- night I caught him because, you know, the, they finally certified Ohio, which went for Trump. Yeah. And so before Thanksgiving dinner, he was, you know, his sister was in charge of Thanksgiving dinner, by the way. Yes. Middle Child did a fantastic job. Let's she give did. her credit. She did. Big I ups. I hope everyone had a wonderful feast at Thanksgiving, and I hope everyone is he- healthy and safe at your house, wherever you are. Uh, we had a vegan Thanksgiving, courtesy of Middle Child, cooking yep. the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you made the bread in the bread, the bread. baking oven I, that I we have. I was in charge yeah. of set up and clean up. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> and you do – oh, you always do a good job of that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, she made two vegan – uh, meat dishes, fake meat, and uh, several side dishes, mm-hmm. of, and all of them were good. Yep. She made vegan mac and cheese, which is terrific. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, she and she put it all out there. It was just wonderful. So, but you don't go into Middle Child's kitchen <laughs> <No>. <laughs> until she she re- she <clears throat> opens the gate and says you can come in you and serve enter. yourself. Right. <laughs> and and it was, th- this is like an ideal situation because it mm-hmm. was a case where this young adult who's mm-hmm. very independent um, mm-hmm. will say, Hey, could you come do this for me and do that for me? I need you to reach this or do that. Like, yeah, right. Legitimately like, saying all the things that are on the top <clears throat> shelf, sure. you're, you're the that, one that needs to go job. get that. Yeah. And can yeah. you do this? And how about that? And I'm thinking of doing this or this or this. And like, you know, you're the cook. Um, it's your call. My experience is this, and I'm sure mm-hmm. it'll turn out great. But right. you know, you've never seen someone happier, more oh, sort yeah. of like dancing yeah. and singing during yep. a pandemic than <clears throat> excuse Finally. Me, her yeah. prepping a meal Finally. Yeah. for yeah. the family in and yep. complete control of the situation. Everybody else shut up and go away. I am going to yep. run this. And it, And she put it all together. Mm-hmm. And so her brother was very patiently. I'm sh- I know he was hungry, but he was right. very patiently sitting at the dining room table with his phone. Yeah. And I look up, 
I look over his shoulder and his phone is open to the Ohio Secretary of State's website. <laughs> Put the goddamn phone down. <laughs> Quit checking election results at the table. <laughs> I just said, you've got to go work for Steve Kornacki. You, you just do. can't not, please. But but I thought John Kasich had delivered Ohio on a silver platter <laughs> because all of our allies are, are – we are not allowed to question any of them or their sincerity or their motives or anything like that. Lord, Luke, yeah. So I, Lord I don't know. Almighty. Lord I guess, Almighty. I guess I don't know what I'm doing. Um, the point being, Junior Dude has his issue. He has a, a yeah. constellation of knowledge that is incredibly right. uh, detailed and fascinating and fun to talk to. He's a fun guy to talk to because he no, really and he's got all play. kinds of fun like um, statistics that he he puts together, like yeah. like Steve Kardacki does. So, yeah. you know, you know these counties used to be bellwether states, but this year they're not, and these yeah. are, these still are. And Georgia has won for the Democrats in these elections. Yeah, no, no Republican seems... has won without thus and so district from thus and so right state, from know? this district. Oh. You you need this district in order to win if you're a Republican, and Trump didn't win it. And he's like he's got all of this, you know, stuff that would be color commentary on MSNBC. If sure. anybody from MSNBC is listening, I'm telling you, this kid <laughs> could speak into the earphone of uh-huh. Steve Kornacki and give him all these fun. It's just like baseball color commentary, right? And, like, and you would never insist in the on rain. It. You would never insist <laughs> elections on elections when it's raining. <laughs> you would never insist on his own morning show where he wears his dad's borrowed clothes and has game shows, which <laughs> right, was terrible. No. The Steve Kornacki yeah. show was was really bad because it's not yeah. what he does. He's terrible, and it was full of both siderism because that was oh, what. Yeah. And you just know this guy is just a is just a statistics wonk. He's a quant jock. That's he, all he wants to do. And he, and he can and he can go without sleep for many right. many days. And putting him uh, you know opposite, yeah. I don't know, uh uh Michael Steele to talk about policy and no. is not he doesn't good. Need to be it doing never that. Go, it never he just goes doesn't well. need to be doing that. No. He that's not that's his skill set is elsewhere and that's but, I'm glad he, they have him. Goodness gracious. So, but I'm with a, I'm with Leslie Jones in terms of being Team Steve Kornacki at oh, what yeah. he does. At what, yeah. he, at what yeah. he does. He's very good at what he does. Yeah. Um, the, the, the point of this being, the, the university lesson for, for today is, the sermon for today is, that, <laughs> that everyone who listens to this podcast, probably with a few exceptions like Charlie Sykes, who I know is listening to this under his covers at home, um, <laughs> doesn't want to admit it to his wife even what he's listening to. He's like, I'm, I'm like Jake from State Farm. He won't admit that he's listening to me at three in the morning, but he is. <laughs> you know he is. Um, it, it's that all of our listeners are in possession of some constellation of knowledge and facts that are incredibly mm-hmm. impressive. I mean, we get mm-hmm. letters all the time, feedback all the time uh, from people that write their local papers and are doing um, – t- t- our, our angel nerd Tammy is just one of those people. You know, she's just yeah. just a political warrior, just an amazing mm-hmm. human being. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But here's the thing. I don't think it's possible for anyone to be expert on everything. To be like right. pundit, you know, I'm a pun- I have an opinion on every fucking subject. I don't. There's a lot of subjects I don't know about, I don't care about, or I'm not qualified to talk about. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. wouldn't know that for me, you know, shooting my bazoo off on this goddamn podcast. But <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that I just don't have any business opining about, except second or third hand, and that's okay. You shouldn't have to be an expert on every single freaking subject. You know who's an expert on every subject? People who are paid money to be subject matter experts mm-hmm. or who do mm-hmm. it out of the love of doing it. Or research librarians. Right. Right. <laughs> and and those people are- Research are, librarians know everything. They're not yeah. human. They're not human. <laughs> um, yeah. Don't take on a table full of research librarians in a trivia game. At trivia. Oh, don't. Cool. Okay. <laughs> but but seriously, the, the deal is that you can't be an expert on everything and you don't have to be passionate about everything either to have uh, a series of shared values. Right. And and this is where I sort of want to discuss some tiers here because we have values and values are we value equality. Mm-hmm. We value justice, fairness, uh, these kind of spiritual qualities. I would call them spiritual. You can call them ethereal or sort of cloud-based or however you want to talk about them. But they're philosophical. They're, they're above – specific issues and they're values that do not change over time that's how you know that you're dealing with a value rather than an issue my value is fairness my value is equality my value is justice so those are things 
that regardless of what the issue is, you have this value that matters to you and and you will see the world through that lens. Mm-hmm. Then you have issues and issues again, can be broken down into two areas, I believe. One is the politics of an issue and the other is the advocacy of an issue. So if you're in politics, if you're an elected official, you have to, you may have to compromise. You may have to write a bill and have it go through committee and have it changed and then have it go through conference committee and have it modified and you might not get all the funding you want and so forth. And eventually, moving back up the scale, the bill that you get passed, and, and again, I'm talking about a world where Mitch McConnell doesn't just sit on it forever. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. The bill that you get passed uh, reflects your values, but may not be everything you want. That's the world of politics. Yes, in that, which we that, all live. We all live in that world where you will not get 100% of what you want. Oh, and, and most importantly, we all live in that world whether we want to or not. Right, you know, exactly. That, that old quote about whether you are take an interest in politics, politics will take an interest in you. Exactly. So exactly. that's the so, world you live in. And, and you can exercise you'll some – You'll get some real victories sometimes. Sometimes yes, you'll get something you want yeah. and it's fantastic. It's a high. You're, how terrific that you got that. Mm-hmm. But in the world of politics, oftentimes you will get 50% of what you want or 70% of what you want or none of what you want. You have to – figure out how to work within the political f- frame to get as much of what you want as possible. That's correct. But Break, but going to the other end of issues, to the advocacy issue, if you're an advocate for something, you're not looking for compromise. No, and that's the thing. The political <laughs> the political frame in which mm-hmm. decisions get made by elected officials is not static. It right. moves. It moves slowly. It's maddening how slowly it moves. But it mm-hmm. does move. It has moved quite a bit since the 70s, for example. Oh, it's my gosh. It's moved <laughs> way the hell right since the 70s. Now, you know, it's – on, on, on most issues. On, on some issues. issues, it has not. And this is this is where you and I sitting down to watch TV mm-hmm. and there is a Old Navy ad yes. with RuPaul <laughs> in drag in Christmas pajamas. Right. Dressed as a as a drag queen, right? Advertising pajamas and Christmas and ornaments and With kids children. are around him kids and every around. children what? are what? there and everybody's yeah. doing everything and and he is she is I think RuPaul goes by he I do it, unless he's in drag and then he goes by she I th- I want I I am sensitive to pronouns I want to be aware of you all to be aware of that uh, he he when he's not in drag goes by he and when he is in drag goes by she. So I will say she because she is in drag in this commercial. But you and I looked at one another and I said to you, if this commercial had been on when I was five years old, the world would have ended. Oh, that's it. In, when you were not, when you and I were little, little, um, yeah. having a black child in a Pepsi commercial or a Coke commercial was, was a big deal, was a radical. Now this is yep. commerce. Okay. We're not talking about yep. the betterment of human nature. No, or, or no, the growth this, is of right. this is commercial. This is commercial. What it, what will sell and what the public will tolerate mm-hmm. without burning mm-hmm. us down or what right. the segment we're interested will we'll tolerate. And mm-hmm. that has changed enormously. Right. I mean, there is not a commercial for that does a broad based appeal that you can look at hardly at all anymore it doesn't have an interracial couple and a gay couple in it somewhere and right. a single person right. a single person raising kids um it's that is a staggering change from when i was a little kid absolutely staggering but but the political frame in which decisions get made is mobile it mm-hmm. does move and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's why it's really hard sometimes because it's like a relativistic experiment Mm-hmm. When viewed from the out, sorry, I just tapped my microphone. I apologize. When That's viewed okay. from the inside, nothing appears to be in motion at all. Like right. shit, it's all it's the same. It's the same. When it appear when you look at it from the outside, from over the course of time, which is why memory is so important. Which is memory why who, is so important. Which is why people who lie about the past should be avoided and and called mm-hmm. out like the fucking mm-hmm. plague because they're mm-hmm. trying to deprive you of your right to understand the context of things, and context is everything. So. Over the course of time, the frame does change. It does move. It moves to the left, moves to the right. 
the the believe it or not, the NRA used to be a a gun safety organization. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That and schools that would have kids how to store their hunting rifles yeah. appropriately. And they would teach yes. them at school. And now it's yeah. just an armed terrorist organization that wants to pump as many lethal weapons into the hands of lunatics as possible for profit. Mm-hmm. And that change, uh, the feeling towards abortion in this country has changed. It is now mm-hmm. pretty widely accepted that it's, you know, 70% of the public says, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world. The Affordable Care Act. Mm-hmm. Is is, oh, is a that. net yeah. positive, and that happened in the in the blink of an eye politically. So, I, I'm just getting back to what you're saying about advocacy. Advocacy mm-hmm. is what moves the frame, right? right. And but advocacy, well, advocacy very- and also commerce. I mean, yeah. this is the thing that we learned through the gay rights and gay marriage issue changing so quickly. Yeah, is that gay money is green? If if only poor people were rich, you know. <laughs> Yes. Problem po- poverty solved, man. Are you kidding poverty me? Poverty solved, man. Yeah. Poor people have buying power. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. No, so, we, we can you start a about... podcast on a free server. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh Yeah, if only poor people had more buying power, then change would come to poor people faster. That is true. <laughs> it would. It would. <laughs> uh, but advocacy um, is, is a different animal than politics. Right. It is. And av- if you are advocating for something, if you are advocating for, uh, you know, clean air, clean water, you're not going to compromise with anybody about those things. No. If you're, if you're advocating for uh, a speed limit on your street because there are children or there's a disabled child on your street and you want to make sure there are speed bumps – on your street because you don't want anybody hit by a car, you're not going to compromise and say only half a speed bump. Right. (laughs) That doesn't work. So, uh, and, and you've, we, again, I keep bringing up your ex, but it is a good example of someone who wants 130% of what she wants all the time for food banks. Because if she, if she asks for 70%, that means somebody's going to go hungry in her eyes. So, No, she's not going to compromise and that in a, way. In a practical yeah. sense, and this is where mm-hmm. Barack Obama, you know, made a, I believe, a terrible mistake. If you've been an advocate for a while, you always ask for one hundred and thirty percent because you're mm-hmm. only going to get seventy. Right. But if you ask for a hundred, you're going to get fifty. And if you ask, if you start off in the middle, you're going to get nothing or next to nothing, which is why. Well, people I think ask. this is where Republicans have understood yes better than Democrats, yes, which have. is. I'm going to insist on splitting 50-50 all the time. Mm-hmm. No matter and what. that way I'll always get 100% of what I want. And, and I will always and, – and I will never be satisfied. I'll always come back to the table wanting h- half again more. And this is why right. – you know, this I, I know we've said this for going on 11 years now. Um, this is why both siderism and false mm-hmm. centrism is so poisonous because viewed inside a static frame, it just appears reasonable. Look, take where the left is and where the right is and just split the difference. Except if you look at it over time, you will see that the the right is always gaining ground and the left is always – we're always demanded of us that we give up stuff, that we give mm-hmm. up ground, we compromise. You know, they're, they're just crazy. They're crazy people. Just give them, give them half. Okay, give them half of the tax cuts for, for rich. Give them – Give them half of the Affordable Care Act because that'll make them happy. No, 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 no. You are appeasing fascists. And guess what? They're never, ever satisfied. It just makes them hungrier. Next time they'll come back, they'll come back for Social Security and your Medicare and your retirement and everything else you have down to your shoes. And that's why you have to understand when you're dealing in a uh, – in a, um, uh, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Um Abusive relationship. Well, yeah, what, what we, if you're dealing with a with a fascist, it's a very different you're thing. You're dealing that, with bad faith, right? You're dealing with somebody exactly in bad the word. faith. If you're arguing with someone who is who is in there in bad faith to destroy you, their goal is to destroy you because they have told themselves or told the mob behind them that you you personally are the threat to democracy, and you mm-hmm. must be. Then any trickery is acceptable. Any lie is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Stealing yeah. the Supreme Court from a sitting president is perfectly okay. Because that's because we're right and God is on our side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so negotiating mm-hmm. only works when everyone is operating in good faith. Republicans haven't operated in good faith for most of my adult lifetime. Mm-hmm, they have mm-hmm. been liars and cheaters and frauds who come to believe 
any means of of seizing and holding power is acceptable. And you can't. And, and I want to give some a couple of examples of that from this week. Okay. Um, because the CEO of Newsmax was interviewed this yes. week yeah. on Peacock, mm-hmm. and uh, Chris Ruddy admitted that. He doesn't believe his network's own bullshit no, no. on television. I mean, do you really believe Diamond and Silk? Why do you have them on your t- TV network? Well, they get rating. Right. And then he he proceeded, as you have would have predicted, Drift Glass. Yes. You know, both sides. Both sides. You know, so isn't you it know, both sides? Isn't it both you know the, the Russia hoax also wasn't true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so... You you can now predict the way these guys go, it, it, but they're fully willing. He was fully willing to admit he didn't believe in diamond and silk, even no. though he has them on his. Well, because network. because the the you know the the homunculi who rely on Newsmax is never going to see that interview. Nope, that's they're never right. Gonna hear this? He they, he can go talk shit about them all day long outside the bubble. He can talk. The, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. they're not going to yeah. listen to anything anyone says that isn't already pre-approved, and you know so forth. Um, but yeah, the, the, and then you the, had a you had a thread on Twitter about Chicago manufacturers that I thought I was did. interesting. I did. Speaking of uh, bad, what I thought was bad faith. Well, yeah, and and because uh, I worked with manufacturers in Chicago many years ago, going more than eleven years ago now, um, to save the manufacturing s- uh, sector for the for the, for America. That was my job. I was in charge <laughs> of saving the manufacturing. And you had a whole bunch of really hardcore right wing Republican types who hated, who hated Barack Obama with the with the heat of a thousand suns, um, who were nonetheless mystified and angry as to why, oh why, all of the their why a China was kicking the shit out of them, and mm-hmm. why you couldn't get skilled labor, why why were all these programs you know to train kids shutting down all of the community colleges were shutting down, how come they weren't funding those, what's wrong with it? And they, they were full of, you know, righteous indignation about everything because that's sort of their default setting. And it was really kind of sad and hilarious to sort of gently explain to them that uh, one gentleman who, who was known for saying, when did we in this country vote to deindustrialize our country? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, mm-hmm. well, when you voted for Reagan. Yep. When you voted for Ronald Reagan, you voted for all this shit, man. You voted to get rid of unions. Which mm-hmm. protected labor. You voted to let companies to begin the process of letting companies chase cheap labor all over the planet, and your sector sh- gave up good American jobs for better profits. Because we're, mm-hmm. we're a supply side economy now. Who cares if you're making if your job is backing groceries? It doesn't matter because everything's going to be really cheap, and your house is going to be worth a ton, and your four hundred one k is never going to go down. So you can live off the float. You don't need to worry about you know a middle-class job because who cares about that shit as long as everything's cheap. And the same people who were perfectly willing to let the labor go overseas yeah, were yeah. suddenly shocked that whole companies were now going overseas. That the profits were going overseas too. The yes, actual manufacturing right, process right. and the ownership right. of the company and, and their whole factory is being replicated across the Pacific Rim using the same cheap, now not so cheap labor that they had perfectly willing to exploit. And that's when they wanted the evil socialist government to intervene. Mm-hmm. And my and my uh, my take at the time when I was dealing in, in a professional fashion was, well, I'd love to help you. I'd love you. And here's the solution. And by the way, here's there's there's a guy. Uh, this is long after I, I left the, the sector. I was laid off and, and uh, in the middle of a recession, which didn't end well for me. But I actually, well, it didn't end well for your whole department either. Right? Well, yeah, my, my department was dissolved, <laughs> uh, but a lot of the institutions I helped found um, are still there and still yeah. and still going very strong and very proud of them. But after I had been uh, dispossessed of my job because they needed my slot for someone with better political connections, um, I made a compendium of all the things that Barack Obama was doing in manufacturing. It's a mm-hmm. long, 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 long list. I just took a sampling of press releases and stuff, stuff I knew from inside knowledge and people I knew inside the industry. And it was and, a, a blog post as well. You, yeah. you, you didn't just keep it for yourself. No, no, no. <laughs> I did a giant blog post about, you know, this is what the Kenyan usurper you hate so much has been doing for the manufacturing sector mm-hmm. during the Great Recession, saving in the, the auto Rust industry. Belt. Yes. In the Rust In the Belt. Rust Belt. And yes. here's, here's manufacturing day at the White House. I went on and on and on and on and on. And it was like... I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to I hear that. I don't want that. to hear that Barack Obama actually did stuff. Yes, Because right. I want to believe that Ronald Reagan was a saint, that somehow this is all a socialist plot, and that Barack Obama made things worse. 
And you cannot debate with someone who who will not give up that mindset, even though in in this case it was just plainly obvious that everything that they believed was bullshit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. but that they were in because they would rather win an argument in bad faith than lose an argument and save their industry. Because power. Because yeah. power. I just like, well, yeah. fuck you then. Fuck you. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and and, yeah. and you can back that person or those people into a corner and get them to admit one little thing and and then it's going to be both sides do it. And then right. it's going to be sides. some yep. other, well, you know, uh, it, maybe this is true, but, you know, he was born in Kenya. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and if it's not that, it's, you know, well, you know, he's in Putin's pocket. You know that, right? You know, Hillary's emails. You know, he just, spied on, you know, he spied on Donald Trump illegally. You know and, that, and right? And there's no <laughs> end to it. There's no, no end to it. They're never going to stop leaping from one conspiracy to the next to the next because when they stop, if they stop, everything mentally and emotionally for them falls apart mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. have to look back along the decades of, of, of being time, wrong, of being wrong and being aggressively wrong, fleeing the truth and being, being, you know, shitty about it, being an asshole about it, smirking at the pain of other people, laughing when kids get tossed into cages. What sort of fucking monster does that? Well, the typical Republican voter is that monster. Your uncle, your cousin, your whatever. That's the monster. And they live next door to you. And they're not going to stop doing this until power is taken away from them forever. And at one last example is Al Franken's story of right before the end of the Obama administration, they were trying so hard to get the uh, Keystone. Keystone XL pipeline pass. Right. right. And they didn't have the votes, and they really didn't have the votes. Mm -hmm. And Al Franken decided to troll them, Mm -hmm. troll the Republicans in the Senate and say, we'll vote for it if you use American steel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He was like, no, we don't think so. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) Yes, Al Franken, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. so we want to talk about Burn the Lifeboats Day, and this is this is in keeping with the pick your battles thing, uh, yes. and to how to how to spot a lifeboat burner, mm-hmm. and and how to how to recognize the argument is over values, and then politics or advocacy. Mm-hmm. So uh, the way you spot a lifeboat burner, mm-hmm. someone who is trying to sneak away from their previous Republican position well, with no accountability. Let's say a lifeboat builder, someone who wants to build a lifeboat and get away from the. Oh, yes. The, I the, didn't say. Did I say lifeboat burner? I'm burner. sorry. We lifeboat are the builder. Yes, we're we the are burners. The burners of we're the lifeboat burners. The people that build lifeboats are trying to sneak away from their past Republicanism without any accountability. Now, there are some who have taken accountability and taken responsibility for their past and that's great uh but if they are if their argument always includes an element of pretending the past did not happen or if it did it wasn't them you're dealing with a lifeboat builder and a liar by the way and And a liar liar. yeah uh and we've seen this a lot uh Particularly, you want to talk about – you go ahead and talk about your post now, the one you wrote today. I, I did a, I did actually two posts. One was very short and one was a longer one. The longer one today um, in a second. The, the short one was, uh, let the no true never Trumper games begin. <laughs> because watching you know TV's Tom Nichols arguing that John Kasich you know, uh, is just you – know, is, is, is just is, – is beyond the pale. Uh, and 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 all the people that follow him saying, you know, he no longer deserves to be considered never Trump. Well, wow! So now there's a schism in the never oh, Trump yeah. movement so there, soon. There has to be because you know, as I said, my money's on the United Synod of the Evangelical Never, never Trump Church of the Beltway to emerge victorious. But then I'm old school. <laughs> it's it's a, it's it's look at look at the name. The name is Never Trump. Did John Kasich want Donald Trump? No, that he's a Never Trump guy. As is Tom Nichols. And I was told repeatedly and incessantly by people who are my allies to shut up and sit down because all allies are equally wonderful. And we shouldn't criticize them because the enemy of my enemy is blah, 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 blah. And now that the minute Kasich turned and said, by the way, uh, we should really move on from Donald Trump. 
you know, because pardoning is, is a way to get us past this. And we really shouldn't focus on what people did in the past. There are a bunch of never Trumpers who are freaked out by that. Like, what do you mean? A bunch of liberals. What do you mean? Well, you know, John Kasich didn't change. John Kasich right. hasn't changed at all. John Kasich was always in favor of getting rid of this one guy mm-hmm. because he mm-hmm. was standing in the way of the rest of the horrible shit his party wants to do. But, and and those of us who were like, you know what? You can't trust these people. You can't. There's a few of them that seem to get it, that it's not Trump. It didn't all start in 2016, that it's all of them. Um, those people are fine. The rest of these people, as long as they continue, that's the test, Blue Gal. That's just what you said. It is the test. As long as they continue to lie about the past, to get really pissed off, if you bring up anything prior to 2016, you can't fucking trust them. Because mm-hmm. they're operating, mm-hmm. they're running some other agenda that has nothing to do with actually cleaning up the mess they made. So this week, uh, it, into my lap, dropped three different examples, <laughs> which was glorious. You, you woke up this morning like it was Christmas. It I was swear Christmas. to God. Well, I woke up this morning to a whole bunch of. Oh, by the way, I'm out of Twitter jail, so I got a lot of. Uh, I got a lot of people on Twitter going, "Dude, David Brooks, oh god, <laughs> dude, Tom Nichols, oh shit." Um, David Brooks wrote a column today called The Rotting of the Republican Mind. When one party becomes... And the rotting started, let me guess. Yeah. Tw- uh, November of 2016. Well, you know, you're awfully close. He doesn't name a specific date, but he does say that uh, the people who started this are the evangelists of distrust from Donald Trump to Alex Jones to follow- followers of QAnon. Now, guess what all three of those have in common? <laughs> They're all post-2016 phenomena. Right. So David Brooks has said explicitly and implicitly that all of this shit started in 2016. And then of course he's free to, to lean heavily into uh, having dispensed with the entire modern history of the Republican party from Nixon's Southern strategy through birtherism. He can get on blaming Donald Trump and his media allies. And it, it goes on and on and on like that. I'm not going to bore you with the entire thing, but he took, and he really sort of busts out the thesaurus so he can, uh, he can try to bring, the economic anxiety lie back to life. See, it wasn't racism, Blue Gal. They're not racist. They just need to feel secure. And deprived of that, they will legitimately feel cynicism and distrust and alienation and anomy. And he goes through this whole jerk-off session about epistemic closure and how they feel lost and, and afraid in their own country. And they're being preyed upon by Donald Trump. No, they fucking invented Donald Trump. Your party created these people. To be this way. And the fact that you can look through the entire article and never see the word race or racism or white supremacy once means David Brooks is back to lying about the Republican Party again. And at the very end, of course, once you've decided that it's the feels of the white supremacy, I'm sorry, the Republicans that need to be respected and felt, Mm -hmm. the, Mm -hmm. the, the only solution is for liberals to reach out to them. (laughs) <laughs> and try to understand them and, and, and calm them because David Brooks had a terrible head injury and slept through the entire Obama administration Yeah, because the Obama administration never happened. Did he ever see the T-shirts that said, Trump, fuck your feeling? Uh, no, he can't see them from where he lives, Blue Cow. <laughs> Uh, he whizzing past them on the uh, Acela Corridor quiet Acela stream. Corridor. He can't quite make out. He know, but he did jog past a bunch of Tea Partiers once and decided they were really nice people because they were re- right next to a bunch of black people and nobody was shooting at each other. So right. racism's not a problem in America. Um, so that was I was like, okay, that's great. I have I have uh, I have material. I can write a David Brooks column. I can get these people off of my back. Um, <laughs> And then I turn over. Poor and, Drift Glass. His, his fandom requires. Dude, you must. You and, must write about this well, David Brooks column. And then, That's fine. He loves doing it. I Please. do. I, once in a great while. Once in a great while. It, it's, it really is. It, it's exhausting to do because I've said it all before. Uh, David mm-hmm. Brooks is a completely predictable phenomenon. He is an absolute lying sack of shit when it comes to the Republican Party and the conservative movement. Either everything's fine or everything will soon be fine because the next little renaissance is right around the corner. And liberals are just as bad, even worse sometimes. And then every now and then the hydraulic pressure from lying about the right and having someone like Donald Trump in the White House gets too much. And he sort of has a tantrum and goes out in his lawn and shakes his fist and yells about Republicans. 
And then a couple of days later, he writes something about campus speech codes and liberals. And his bosses put him back and say, there, there, David, calm down. Remember, we don't pay you to talk like a liberal blogger. We pay you to lie about both sides because without that, our paper will fold up and blow away. So I thought, well, I'm done now. I'm done. And then some son of a bitch sent me a link to Mr. Tom Nichols on Twitter, Mm -hmm. which I couldn't read because Tom Nichols blocks me on Twitter. Uh, because I told him that his party actually existed prior to 2016. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> so he got real mad at me for talking about things that happened before 2016. And being a big old coward like David Brooks, he just shut shut the door. Nope, don't want to talk about it. Also, I don't have a blue check. He's perfectly willing to talk to, to Charlie Pierce. But I don't have a blue check, so I'm nobody. So And he lives you know, on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. But suddenly... Literally overnight, and this actually happened on the Bulwark podcast today. They, they, he took his tweets and read them aloud, basically, on the Bulwark podcast. Okay. Um, I'm going to read you from my post one sentence. Today we find Mr. Nichols not just making the word we and us do some heavy lifting, mm-hmm. but flogging them nearly to death as he forces them to build a monument to Tom Nichols, heroic leader of the resistance. Mm-hmm. And he goes on for tweet after tweet after tweet. Uh, saying things like, um, oh, let's see. What I'm telling you is that we know it's not that complicated, and the minority of people better get their asses in gear and start learning about what makes the rest of us tick. Notice how Tom Nichols is now us. The rest of us? Us. He's now us, Blue Gal. We're not on his team. He's now our leader. So you mm-hmm. better shut up and respect him. Right. And he is so fucking tired of people going to rural Wisconsin like anthropologists on a field trip. Take those same people from Oshkosh and put them on a bus to Boston or L.A. and say, you'd better learn about these people. They're your fellow citizens, and they way outnumber you. And Wow, one more. he's found Jesus. But more to the point, why is it always a plea for, quote-unquote, us to understand, quote-unquote, them? Why is it always one way? Why uh. is there never a plea or a demand to people in rural Indiana to say, listen, you better start understanding the 100 million Americans who aren't like you? And then he has something to say about, you know, you know, where back- was Tom Nichols? No. And I mean this question quite literally. Yes. Because I don't know the answer to this. Yes. Where was Tom Nichols in 2014? He was, as he has said, I don't think he's ever repeated this lie. But remember, Tom Nichols is a coward and a liar. <laughs> so he's I, I don't think and he only he only goes on television shows and podcasts where no one will ask him hard questions. Well, I'm asking the hard question. Where was Tom Nichols in 2014? Tom Nichols says that he never knew. I swear this is true. He was on um, the Joy Reid show Uh along with a couple of other never Trumpers. I think Michael Uh Steele, et cetera. And Uh his excuse was I was in Massachusetts and therefore never knew the Republican Party was full of Republicans. (laughs) So the Republican, he... (laughs) So he he just knew Massachusetts Republicans. He knew nothing. Drink Chardonnay with him yes. in his in his den because yeah, okay. they don't have the internet in Massachusetts. They don't have television. Right. They don't have radio. They don't have newspapers. Mm-hmm. They don't have history. Mm-hmm. This is the guy who wrote a book about the death of expertise and how stupid Americans are and how they formulate their opinions based on bullshit that they don't even know about. Who has been formulating his opinion about the Republican Party based on bullshit he knew nothing about, and I have no problem with that. My problem is when it turns out you never knew the slightest fucking first thing about what you were talking about, you need to shut up and go away. You need to lose your position at the front of the line. You need to stop talking about shit you don't know anything about. But no, because Tom Nichols wants to be on TV. Tom Nichols is a senior advisor of the Lincoln Project. Suddenly, Tom Nichols is us. Mm -hmm. And, And we are sick and tired of those goddamn Republicans uh, who think they deserve special treatment. They need to come and beg our forgiveness of what they do, Blue Gal. And then he goes on about um, how they don't give a shit about New York City, how suddenly drugs and poverty are a cultural problem now that it's white people, but back when it was black people, I'm like, holy shit. He's just going through the entire corpus of liberal blogs going back 20 years, 15 right. years, and right. pulling paragraphs out and throwing them up on the internet, knowing, knowing, that none of his fucking cronies in the mm-hmm. media is ever going to call him on it. He can right. sit there with his ass hanging out, and, and the only people who are going to talk back to him are nobody liberal bloggers who he just shuts out because they're inconvenient. Well, he just blocks them, yeah. But but so he thinks the entire – he thought in 1994 that the entire Republican Party was 
William Weld and Mitt Romney oh, yeah. is oh, what yeah. you're saying. Oh, no, he's he he thinks he has said, you know, he has been asked sort of the, very in a very gentle way. How did you not notice your Republican Party was fucking insane? And said, it's, well, I was in Massachusetts. I was in Massachusetts the whole time. Now, that is better than Michael Steele, who said literally, yeah, uh, it was a bunch of bigots before I showed up. Then all the bigots left. Then I was thrown out. Then the bigots came back. No, right, right. I, than- I erase, I remove the bigots from the Republican Party. If they'd only continue to trust me, the mm-hmm. Republican Party would continue to be bigot free. Right, <laughs> right. And, and I'm sure that's what he tells himself in the mirror at night. So he yeah. doesn't, yeah. you know, walk into the ocean. But, <laughs> but this is what they're, they are always the hero of their own little stories. And mm-hmm. it, it is impossible to get Tom uh, Nichols to admit that he never knew what the fuck he was talking about. Because that would That's really amazing. fly in the face of a guy who wrote a book on expertise and why you should respect <laughs> it. And you can never get Charlie Sykes to admit that he, as the Rush Limbaugh of Wisconsin, might have had a little something to do with his party losing its mind. I, I end the post with a an interchange between Charlie Sykes and Mona Charon, who are now both, you know, she's now has left a position somewhere. is now like a senior policy person at the Bulwark. Yeah. Now, mind you, th- these are people who are all discredited. They all – everything about the Republican Party they knew was proved to be a lie four years ago. And they picked up and they moved over and got a shit ton of funding. And now they're a going media but, but empire. But, class, I yep. think there is mm-hmm. – I think there is just a critical mass of millionaires – Oh, yes. Who love their tax cuts and want to dabble in politics and think that funding an operation like the Bulwark is a good thing. And it's because and and politics is the hobby that gets them their tax cuts. And being a Republican is the hobby that gets them their tax cuts. And they have a they have a, a they have an image of themselves as I'm not a racist. And I'm yeah, I'm sophisticated. I'm sophisticated, but I'm but I'm also greedy. I have <laughs> so, I have I have yes. no idea what happened to the Republican Party, but I certainly I certainly had nothing to do with it. Don't get me started. I used to be married to that. You know, I was okay. And um, <laughs> so happy lifeboat burning day, everyone. Because yeah, lifeboat burning. Uh-huh. Let's burn those lifeboats and just be remember to always for, no fair remembering stuff. Right, yeah. that's the key. Yeah, if you if you are capable of remembering what happened before the escalator ride. And you're acknowledging that and saying, I was a part of it as a, as a Republican. You know, if this is, if you're a never Trumper and you really think Donald Trump's an existential threat to democracy and the Republican party is the party that did it. And you acknowledge that publicly. Great. great. You're with us. You're, you can be team professional left. We're all for you doing that. Yes. Uh, if, if, however, you say, look, I had no idea before 2016 that there was any kind of problem in the Republican Party with race or cheating or, or voter suppression, <laughs> voter suppression. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, Donald Trump is just this terrible person and we have to get rid of him so we can rebuild the Republican Party to be what it used to be in the era of Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. No, we're going to burn your lifeboat. Well, you know, you know what the shibboleth is, you know, the shibboleth from the, the yeah. Bible. The, here, the. If they cannot form their mouth to to say the phrase, the left was right about the right <laughs> all along, then they are your enemies. Now, they may yeah. be nice and they may be friendly and they may be affable and they might have their own television show. But if they cannot, in their own conscience, in their own heart, acknowledge that these highly paid political professionals whose, whose expertise goes back decades, either – have been lying for 20 years, 30 years, or have been mm-hmm. so fucking deluded that their opinions are worthless for 20 or 30 years. And that the humble liberal bloggers in the middle of nowhere knew more about their own party than they did, then you shouldn't listen to them because they can't be trusted. Mm-hmm. But you know what? There's a whole bunch of people who said, uh, Republicans who said Donald Trump's a menace and they just wish he was gone forever. Where did they say that, blue gal? Um, they said it apparently to to Carl Bernstein privately. Oh, yeah. They whispered in his ear. They whispered. <laughs> I think we mentioned this last week. They whispered in his ear. I I really uh, don't tell anyone this. No, don't this, tell anyone. he tweeted this on on the twenty second. So that was oh, only okay. five days ago. So we didn't talk about this last week. But uh, Carl Bernstein, bless his heart, said, "I'm not violating any pledge of journalistic confidentiality in reporting this." Twenty run Republican senators, in conversations with colleagues, staff members, lobbyists, White House aides, have repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. expressed extreme contempt for Trump and his fitness to be president. 
The 21 per- senators who have privately expressed their disdain for Trump are, and then yeah. he lists them. <laughs> Portman, Alexander, Sasse, Blunt, Collins, Murkowski, Cornyn, Thune, Romney, Brown, Young, Tim Scott, Rick Scott, Rubio, Grassley, Burr, Toomey, McSally, Morin, Roberts, Shelby. All of them. Yeah. 21 senators. They they spit Trump's dick out of their mouth long enough to say, I really hate this. I really hate that I'm doing this. And then right back to sucking his dick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, and this is, this is the Republican. There is no other Republican party out there that's waiting in the wings to come in and be good, decent. Um, you and know. so that's when I want to ask, mm-hmm. though, if I had, if I could ask them one question. Yes. Those 21 Republican senators. So I would I would bring all of this up as background. There's and a then 21 say, pilot stoke in there some there. So, no. Yeah. I would ask – and then I would ask them, what are your values? Yeah. And what they value is staying in office. Right. And power. that's it. Power. That's it. Power. Power for the sake of power. Yep. You know, that was that was actually an answer. That's Orwell's. You know, this, the, the mm-hmm. ends of power is power. Cause, yeah. Because there was – there's all of these very – well-intentioned, I'm sure, liberal people out there. I'm thinking of – I might it might not be Chris Hayes, but someone like him who was like, I don't understand what the goal is. If you mm-hmm. don't if you don't care about any of this shit, what is your policy? What what are you in this for? Yeah, like, what's your dude, value? Yeah. <laughs> the ends of power is power. They want power mm-hmm. for power's sake. They don't want it for any other reason. And they would rather kill the country than give it up. Yeah. And that's – it's as simple as that. And once you get that through your head – it's an easy lens to examine everyone's motives in politics and see where they're coming from and who can be trusted and who can't be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I want you to just take a moment because we're running out of time to talk sure. about Mark Halperin. Well, Mark Halperin, uh, here's a thought. Don't follow Mark Halperin's career path. <laughs> Poor Mark Halperin is over at Newsmax, where oh, they've God. also got Diamond and Silk. <laughs> he is. He last seen, he was co-anchoring mm. uh, a, a show on Newsmax. Newsmax, in which they were interviewing Crazy Lady Sidney Powell. Yeah, and the, yeah. and just as she vomited, projectile vomited madness in every direction. And, but she's uh, an insider, Drift Glass, right. and he's getting he's getting the insider. He's got access to the inside of the Donald Trump campaign and, legal team. Oh wait, she's not on the legal team. Yeah. Well, she oh, is. Well, I'm- <laughs> she secretly is. You can't fire me. I'm an independent hero, and I'm going to tell things about people. And by the way, write a check to Sidney Powell in in La Land, Florida. <laughs> yeah, personal check. Personal check right, right made out to check. her personally mm-hmm. is going to turn this election around for sure. And I, uh, <laughs> I did. I, I found that picture of of him sitting on Donald Trump's lap in Donald Trump's helicopter. Oh yeah, back in the good old days when Mark Halperin was everybody's favorite asshole, and nobody could get rid of Mark Halperin, be, and liberals could scream. And this is still true until he decided to rub his junk up on some female employees who didn't like it. His right. career was he couldn't bulletproof. Keep his, he couldn't keep his privacy in his pants at work. Right. Yes. And, he, yes. and his friends on Morning Joe have tried to smuggle him back on the air Absolutely. repeatedly. Nika has tried. And, yep. And here's the thing. It didn't matter that he was incompetent, that he was a liar, that he was a mm-hmm. Republican no. stooge. That no. he, the, the, the fact that he was shit at his job was completely irrelevant to him having the job. What got him fired was being a sexual predator and getting caught. And and so don't follow any of his career path, please, for God's sakes. And I just took that picture of him on the on the air on the helicopter with Donald Trump, both smiling, big old smiles. Said, "Don't worry about those pointy rocks that seem to be rushing up to you really, really fast, Mark. Just pretend it's the good old days and you're flying." <laughs> you know what? I can't wait for drift class. Uh, the Mike Pence podcast. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I am so looking forward to that. Let's do a news roundup. All right. After you. Trump pardoned Michael Flynn, his first national security advisor, who pleaded guilty twice to lying out to the FBI about his Russian contacts during the presidential transition in late 2016 and early 2017. The gypsy woman was right, Blue Gal. Yep. Uh, Joe Biden has dismissed pursuing investigations into Trump after he leaves office, saying, I will not do what this president does and use the Justice Department as my vehicle to insist that something happened. That does not mean, he said editorially, 
that yeah. the Justice Department will not pursue the criminality of the Trump administration or that state courts and local courts won't vigorously pursue him. It simply means right. I'm not going to use the Justice Department as a political weapon to lock up my end. Right. I mean, it's not a banana republic. No. It's We talked about this last week, I we think. Did. It's not... It's not lock her up. It's not lock him up. It's it was, let the legal if there system, are crimes committed, we're going to have to let the FBI investigate exactly, that. Exactly. Exactly right. Pennsylvania and Nevada certified their 2020 election results and awarded a combined 26 electoral votes to Joe Biden. Oh, it's close now. Who knows how people <laughs> turn out? Um, <laughs> according to one survey today, only 3% of Trump voters called Republicans believe that Biden legitimately won the 2020 election. While 73% consider Trump the winner, 24% said they're not sure. Mm-hmm. This is this is trutherism. Yeah, this is you know, so dangerous. Truthers. This is so dangerous. Flat and Earth. It, it's yeah. Flat Earth. It's birtherism. It's, it's, birther, it's birtherism. It's with, QAnon. It's birtherism and, and, with a gun, you know? Yeah. And, and let's be clear, too, that you would not have QAnon if it wasn't for both siderism. Right. Absolutely not. No. The reason you have QAnon is because Democrats have to be just as bad as right. throwing kids in cages or as, as Donald Trump golfing all the time, as Donald Trump's inhumanity to women. So if, if Democrats are just as bad or worse, then they have to be drinking the blood of babies because then they're just as bad or worse. And if you don't have both siderism, if you're actually able to look things clearly and not have both siderism, you wouldn't have QAnon. Two separate New York State fraud investigations into Donald Trump and his businesses have expanded to include about $26 million in consulting fee tax write-offs, some of which went to Ivanka Trump. Oh, no. That nice lady might go to jail. Oh, no. Uh, 53% of Republicans would vote for Trump in 2024. And in stupid coup news... Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama is on Twitter shrieking that Joe Biden did not win the lawful vote majority in Georgia. And per its right and duty, Congress should reject any Georgia submission of 16 Electoral College votes for Joe Biden. Clearly. William They're just <laughs> going to continue to try to remove black voters' wishes that's, from the equation. That's the whole game. Uh, in yeah. COVID news, the U.S. reported its highest daily coronavirus death toll in more than six months. Nearly 2,100 COVID-19 deaths reported Tuesday is the highest mark since May 6th, when states reported a combined total of 2,611 fatalities. The White House Coronavirus Task Force called for significant behavior change of all Americans, including the wearing of masks to mitigate the spread. There is aggressive, rapid, and expanding community spread across the country, reaching over 2,000 counties, a set of White House task force reports said. Mm -hmm. Yep. Speaking of people who, and we report on a few celebrities and famous names who get coronavirus on this podcast every week, Donald Trump Jr. tested positive for the coronavirus. A spokesman said Trump Jr. tested positive at the start of last week has been, quote, quarantining out at his cabin since the result. But he was at um, Camp David last night with Shush. a bunch of people around a fire. That's no? his cabin, honey. That's his cabin. <laughs> Camp David is his cabin where mm-hmm. he's quarantining. It's Camp Donald and it's mine siblings. now. It's mine now. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Trump skipped the G20 Summit's pandemic preparedness and response event to play golf. Of course he did. He has played golf over 400 days yeah. while he's been an uh, entire year. Yep. And remember when, remember back in the good old days when your conservative friends would scream about how much golf Barack Obama oh, played? Yeah. And why doesn't he get back to uh, work? No fair remembering stuff. Yeah, no glass. fair remembering stuff. Your head will explode. The Trump administration vaccine distribution team will not brief Biden's transition team and, quote, has no plans to do so. After the CDC warned Americans against traveling for Thanksgiving, tens of millions of Americans traveled for Thanksgiving. And I do wish them well. I really do. I hope that we get a big surprise and no one gets sick. Yep, I do too. I I don't want anyone to die. I don't want anyone to go to war. I don't want bad things to happen. I want bad people to stop trying to kill my country. 
Mm-hmm. And I want the people who are currently in the White House to stop sabotaging everything, burning everything down on their way out, like Hitler leaving France. Yeah. And it's really hard to protect yourself mentally at this mm-hmm. time. Uh, I wish everybody the ability to do that who's listening to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tuesday this week, I couldn't stop crying. Nope. I just couldn't stop crying. And you were worried about me mm-hmm. and kept coming over. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I just kept crying. And I finally found a source for it. I was standing in the kitchen crying. <laughs> and I said, I finally figured out why I'm so down and why I'm so depressed. It's because everybody's dying. Yes. And I'm I'm sitting on Twitter and everybody's reporting that somebody's died in their family. Yep. Someone's died. Someone's died. Someone's died. Someone died. Mm-hmm. And you can only take so much of that. Um, there are psychologists warning that as the death toll goes up, our sympathy goes down. Yep. It is a it is a way of protecting yourself mentally from devastation, from being overwhelmed, and from being overwhelmed. Yeah. And uh, you know there there are ties from that to uh, genocide and other things that are really really bad. That people shouldn't protect themselves from and should stand up against. But uh, it is important without engaging in compassion fatigue and writing it off to protect yourself emotionally and mentally from the news from time to time and take a break when you need to. Can I give you some local news? Sure. Our neighbors told me on my way in today that their Mm -hmm. new baby granddaughter loves her blanket from France. Oh, I knit a baby blanket for charity and and I have a conduit at church through which I can donate blankets to needy children, hospitals, etc. And so I will knit little baby blankets. I'm always knitting anyway, but I knit. And so I have these Ziploc bags with in my closet of blankets ready to go out and baby Elizabeth next door was playing in her jumpy seat, and I ran mm-hmm. in the house and grabbed a blanket, and I'm so glad she likes and it. And they're very That's happy great. with it. They're very, very That's happy wonderful. with it. Yes, That's it wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm, and uh, we are going to have a new baby in our family. We are. Uh, your niece is going to have a baby next April, and we yes. found out it's a boy. So, so that screwed that up. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. You know what I had to do? I had to go out and buy yarn I, because I have so much pink in my I, on my shelves. I was devastated. I just I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> You know, couldn't we just dial the pink stuff blue? And I was told, please sit down and be quiet. This is a Wendy's drive through <laughs> This is, sir, this is a Wendy's drive through We yeah. don't have yarn here. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we love you all, folks. We really yeah, love you. We do. And, uh, you know, we have new content every week because we love you. That's why we're here is because mm-hmm. not talking to you, not hearing back from you was just not not something it, that's an option for us. So yeah, we actually uh, got someone on Twitter said, are they going to have a podcast this week? And oh yeah. We had, yeah. well, I think 10 grand said, Oh, they're up every Friday. They have been every doing Friday. that since you the beginning me? of time. They podcasted on their wedding day for since, gosh sakes. Since Christ was a corporal, they've been dropping on Fridays. <laughs> Come on. We drop Come on, on Fridays because <laughs> we can't not hear, hear back from you and yeah. talk to you and have this uh, family time with you. So we, yeah. we want you to know how much you guys mean to us and we keep those cards and letters coming. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is Suzu, sometimes called Zuzu. She is five years old and she has been living at this house uh, with her owners for one year. She spent the first three months at her new house hiding under a blanket. So, uh, Her forever home owners patiently loved her until she finally decided that they were worth her time and attention. You know what, Zuzu? I know how you feel. There's sometimes I would love to sleep on just just be under a blanket for about a year. She just she just wasn't quite ready to to talk to people, but now she wakes uh, them up every morning by singing the freshly poured theme song in her own language, and she has the cutest little voice you've ever heard. <laughs> and she's also an upside down kitty, another upside down kitty. So, Suzu, Zuzu, we're so glad to have you. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Our fake sponsor, freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. 
And you can visit Suzu Zuzu at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, look, gal, the Internet Kitties were not happy about our all-vegan Thanksgiving dinner this year. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.